Hi everyone, and welcome to the Illustration Department Podcast. I am your host, Giuseppe Castellano. In this podcast, I talk to folks in illustration, animation, and other creative fields about their beginnings, their successes, and the bumps and bruises they've experienced along the way. In this episode, I talk to John Cockley, the co-founder of Handsome Frank. A few years back, John and his cousin Tom met at a pub. By night's end, their prestigious illustration agency was born. Among other topics, we discuss the joys of fatherhood. John takes us behind the scenes at Handsome Frank, including how he finds artists. And he explains why, despite the challenges, it's very possible to earn a very good living as an illustrator. I hope you enjoy our conversation. So, uh, John, I'm really glad that we were able to finally schedule uh, this this conversation. It's taken a little while. It's taken a few weeks, a few emails back and forth, a few cancellations. Uh, and so much of that has to do with the fact that we both um, have kids in our lives. <laughs> Yeah, they do. Uh, they do tend to to get in in the way in, in the nicest possible way. <laughs> exactly. Um, so I have I have John here, uh, co-founder of Handsome Frank, one of the premier global illustration agencies. Period. Um, so the first question I want to ask you, this is the first question I think that mm. is on everyone's mind. How long is too long before you eat a Cheerio off the ground? <laughs> It's the five second rule, isn't it? <laughs> That's it. Just five. <laughs> just five seconds. That, I mean, we've got a dog in this house. If you don't, if you don't take it in five seconds, uh, Hendrix is taking it. It's a lesson I have to keep relearning, unfortunately, um, as I'm cleaning the home and I see the 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 odd Cheerio or Goldfish. <laughs> I've uh, I've I've you know I, for I've had my oldest is eleven, so I've had eleven years of having to learn this lesson. I still haven't learned it. Sometimes you pick it up and it's okay, and sometimes you pick it up and eat it and it's not okay. <laughs> yeah, the, one of one of the um, yeah lovely things about being a being a dad, I guess. Uh, how many children get in your way nicely? Uh, so I have three. I have, uh, I have three children who are now um, nine, seven, and four. So uh, yeah, the past I guess the past nine years have been a bit of a a whirlwind really mm-hmm. i feel like i feel like we're slightly coming out of the really hardcore bit maybe mm-hmm. <laughs> but yeah it's been it's been an intense few few years mm-hmm. and um i mean it's been great and and, and to be honest it's it, it was kind of the catalyst for um setting up the company in the first place to mm-hmm. be honest well before we talk about that and i definitely want to talk about that so you know before handsome frank what were you what mm-hmm. were you up to well, I went to university, studied um, uh, linguistics, left university in what, 2001 and really kind of just drifted around a bit, really. Um, my folks are from, from Cambridge, so I moved back here. I very much had the ambition to move to London. So I ended up kind of taking the first job um, I was offered in London just to, just to get myself down there, um, which was for a, a publishing company. Um, but it was a sales role. It was a sales role selling the very small um, classified ads in the back of a, a fairly kind of dry marketing magazine, now defunct. <laughs> and um, it was lovely people, nice atmosphere. It was great. I was working in Soho, so it was just um, very nice to be working in such a kind of buzzy part of London. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I kind of noticed there was this very exciting kind of interesting sexy magazine across the floor which turned out to be a publication called creative review and i remember just being very kind of um i didn't really understand it i didn't really understand what it was all about um but being very aware of the fact that it it, it really interested me and um there was something kind of more exciting visually going on over the other side of the office um, so I kind of manufactured a, my way across the office floor <laughs> after a few months and um, ended up working for, for Creative Review. And that that really was kind of the gateway for me into the world of um, design and, and, and advertising and ultimately illustration. Uh, what were you doing there? What was part of what was your responsibility? Yeah, I was a sales guy, which was great. Um, you know, I used to um, be the person who was, you know, picking up the phone and, um, you know, banging out. 50, 60 phone calls a day, selling advertising in, 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 in an advertising, in a magazine about advertising. 
and I ended up, I stayed there for the best part of 10 years and um, I ended up running the commercial team. So, you know, that kind of encompassed um, events, uh, publications, um, you know, we, it was very much the early days of online advertising. So um, setting up, uh, being involved in setting up the blog and, and you know, subsequently an app, um, you know, the kind of advent of, of the iPad and everything that that changed in publishing I really enjoyed it. I met lots of interesting people. And some of the interesting people I met were um, illustration agents who were my, um, who were my clients. Mm-hmm. So I was selling advertising to, um, to, to some of the big illustration agencies in London. Over time, became, became very interested in, in their business and, and what they were doing and um, uh, had some ideas about how perhaps we could do it slightly differently, um, which led eventually to, to making that leap to, to Hans and Frank. During that time, is that when you started having kids? Yeah, so I had we had our first in two thousand nine. So t- I guess towards the end of my time there, and uh, you know, to be honest, I think I was ready for a move anyway. Mm-hmm. But I was I was commuting at that point. I left I did the classic thing of my wife got pregnant with our first child, and we thought, well, it's time to leave London. You know, we need to to move a bit further out. So we moved to Cambridge, which is um, a fifty minute train train ride out of, out of London. And, um, yeah, I just remember having this incredible kind of <laughs> sense of uh, just this crushing feeling, really, when my, my um, paternity leave came to an end. The fact that I was gonna, felt like I was going to miss out on so much, mm-hmm. you know, commuting kind of an hour and a half, you know, once you add on the tube journey, an hour and a half each way every day and just being away and not being here in the morning and not being here in the evening. So that was very much the catalyst to me thinking, right, it's time to to find something else, to, to, to do something off my own mm-hmm. back and perhaps do something that will allow me potentially to have more of a kind of life-work balance or, or certainly a different balance. So you decided, I'm going to start an illustration agency. It happened at a pub, the conversation to, to <laughs> yeah. begin this. Is that right? Exactly. Well, I think all the best things happen at the pub. Well, uh, of course. But yeah. Yeah. So I, I approached um So the other, very much the other person in, in this story is, uh, is Tom, who is the fellow um, co-founder and, and um, director of, of Hanson Frank, who uh, is actually my cousin as well. And yeah, I, I sort of approached Tom and said, look, I've got this this idea. Tom at the time was uh, um, working as a, um, uh, a designer in um, digital advertising. And he he was basically someone I knew who could who could make websites. <laughs> I, I had no idea how to how to really do that. So initially, I approached him and said, um, "Hey, do you want to build me a website?" We went to the pub, had a few drinks, talked it through. By the end of that evening, we decided that actually we had a much better chance if we kind of um, put our heads together and pulled our resources and our sort of shared knowledge. And we had quite complementary backgrounds, really. Tom studied design you know he went to he went to art college I didn't um he'd worked in advertising I'd worked in publishing he had a creative job I I had a you know more of a sales background so they seemed to complement each other really well and um yeah by the end of that evening he was kind of on board as a as a founding partner so I guess the second thing everyone wants to know is (laughs) how many drinks does it take for one to decide that running an illustration agency is a viable career option? (laughs) Yeah, it certainly helped. I think, I think by the end of the evening, um, the ambition certainly ramped up. (laughs) (laughs) You had enough liquid courage to decide. Let's do this. I've still got a notebook somewhere actually had this, um, pages and pages of scribbled ideas and potential names and all sorts of stuff. Mm -hmm. And in, in the morning it actually was less, uh, less of a, coherent plan than I thought it had been at the time <laughs> but uh no you know it's I, I, I'm a great believer in sometimes you just need to get together whether it be um in a pub or, or wherever is conducive and just just talk things out and, and just put ideas out there and um yeah there's some gold in there somewhere if you if exactly. you look deep in- handsome Frank uh where did the name come from so Frank Frank was our, our grandfather we're, we're cousins our our um, mothers are sisters Frank was their father, uh, and he was just a you know he was a great guy. He when we founded the company, he was still around. He he lived um, late into his nineties, and he was just somebody that um, was very I guess very inspirational to both of us. He was he was an artist. He was uh, somebody that was always 
very positive um someone that was very full of life and and you know traveled a lot in his life and really felt that life was for living plus he had a great name you know <laughs> <laughs> um, so it felt it just felt right to kind of have this family connection in the agency mm. name um and yeah i think people really like it i think um I think people like the fact there's a story behind a name and it's not just a cool name for the sake of a, of a cool name. Mm-hmm. And I always say that to people when, when they talk to me about naming a business, I just sort of say, well, make sure there's a story because people will ask people say, you oh, know, where's the name from? And, and I think it feels a bit empty if, um, if, if it's just something you like the sound of. What was that first year? Like once you set it up, um, how did you find your first clients? I mean, what was, what was the, the how, how did you sort of build that foundation? I mean, look, looking back, we I, it's funny. I don't think we were actually particularly ambitious. And I know that sounds, um, I think we had fairly modest expectations to the point where we were certainly very unsure as to whether it could be a full-time job, um, even for one of us, let alone um, both. So the first year really consisted of meeting illustrators, quite a few of which are still with us to today, and um, kind of convincing them um, with absolutely nothing to show that, that, that they should let us represent them. Um, so that's a huge leap of faith. And I'm very grateful to the guys that kind of came on board um, early on. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah, just I mean, we, we, we never took a bank loan. We um, we kind of we just I, I mean, hustle's not a word I really like particularly, but we we, we just try to do things differently, try to do things that would um, get people's attention but without spending the cash. We didn't have a marketing budget. And yeah, just, just a, a huge amount of picking up the phone and talking to people, which I guess is is where my background came in. Mm-hmm. And from there, it just seemed to, to, to pick up. And to be entirely honest, at the start, we saw it very much as a, as a, as a kind of UK business for UK illustrators um, working with UK clients. And um, I think the real breakthrough moment, we got a phone call about three months in from um, Sarchi's in LA who wanted us to work on a, on a, on a project for, for Toyota. And, um, you know, it kind of blew our minds. We were, you know, one of the biggest car companies in the world, you know, an ad agency whose name we've known somebody in, in LA has heard of us. So that was kind of mind blowing. Um, and also just opened our eyes to the potential, I guess. And since then it's become a very international business. Um, we do a lot of work in the U S we do a lot of work, all over Europe in the Far East. Mm-hmm. Um, our, uh, our our illustrators who originally all lived in and around London um, are a very transient bunch. Most of them have left <laughs> uh, for various reasons. Um, but we've, we've gone on to sign people all over the world, repping people in five continents now. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, it's become very, very international. Um, and I guess over the past, you know, nine or ten years, um, the world has got smaller in many ways. Um, in terms of business but we certainly didn't see that um happening that was a happy a happy kind of occurrence did you quit your day job and then form this or was there some overlap no there there was some overlap really and we were quite lucky um in because i know this is something a lot of people struggle with you know when you make that leap of faith i mean i we we set it up we, we had jobs um i had a little pay as you go mobile phone in my in my drawer and one day it rang <laughs> while I was at work and um, yeah, it kind of grew very, very organically. And then I was able to take, a, um, I took a, a job with a um, design agency back here in Cambridge and was very honest with them and said, look, I've got this um, side business, but um, you know, it's, it's, I said to them in the interview, I, I don't think it's ever going to be a full time job. So I took a three day a week job with them uh, working two days on Handsome Frank. Um, and soon it became two and three, and then it became four and one. Then I was able to go full time, and and about six months later, I was saying to Tom, "Look, you need you need to quit your job and come and help me." Um, so yeah, we were lucky in a way. We we were able to do it in a in a sensible way, and you know we both had very young kids. We had mortgages, so we we did it in as sensible a way as we could, really, because mm-hmm. um, we had those responsibilities. So yeah, the, the 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 dilemma of how to to do it and how to make that leap is um, is a constant one, really. Mm-hmm. But I I found that the more time we put into it, just you know, the huge benefit to the business was 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 seen almost instantly. Your client 
list is, is impressive to say the least. You know, Audi, Google, American Express, Cartoon Network, on and on and on. As an agency, how do you either reach out to them or do you just through a word of mouth and through sort of the quality of your product and your and the folks that you represent, are they just coming to you? I mean, is there or is there maybe a little bit of both? Um, I think in the, yes, and early on it was very much about us actively going out there and trying to talk to people. These days, what what we try to do is we do a lot as an agency in terms of promoting ourselves as a as a, as a collective. So we um, create films about our artists. We publish an annual newspaper, which um, which came out recently. We we, we printed twelve thousand copies this year. We love to do things like exhibitions, um, and we've, we've done a number of kind of uh, events in here in here in London. So our our, our idea is to kind of um, you know I think I think the, the wheel has changed a little bit. I think you know maybe fifteen twenty years ago, um, being an illustration agent was about who you knew. Um, you had a little black book of art buyers, and um, you know you keep in touch with them. You perhaps take them out for lunch, and 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 it was very much that kind of world. Now I feel that it's it's about who knows you, and how you can reach as many people as possible. So you know we we obviously use social media a lot. Um, we we you know we take every opportunity we get to go and um, speak to people. So we've, we've spoken at events in Barcelona and Bucharest and Miami this year, and it's just about really getting our getting our name out there as, as much as possible in the right circles. So that because for me the illustration is a product and, and creative people as a, as a group and not a group of people that like to be sold at, you know, it's not a hard sell. So it's all about being front of mind as, and when somebody has a need for it, you know, nobody's going to commission an illustrator if they don't have to, or they don't have the right brief. It's very much a case of just staying in front of people's minds so that as, and when they need you, they know where you are. Mm -hmm. And that's what we try and do through these, various touch points why do you guys do those artist films i see i've seen them and they're all um i mean they're obviously they're well produced but what's the what's the reasoning behind that because i don't think i've ever i don't think i've seen not that i'm sure other folks have done it i just haven't seen it personally um an yeah. agency actually creating video uh about their their the illustrators they represent i guess it's kind of threefold um the the first the primary reason is when you're talking to a client or talking to an agency about an artist um and you know perhaps there were other illustrators in the fray or um you know there's some um, questions being asked about who the person is and how they work we find that it really helps if you can say okay here's a here's a quick sort of three four minute film about this person um watch this and by the end of that you'll have a much better idea of of who they are where their work comes from uh, how they work, you know, their process. And it, I think it just helps, you know, it, it, what it does is it, it stops illustration from being a commodity and it makes, it makes the, whoever's paying for it, uh, or commissioning it, it makes them realize that there's a person behind the work. Mm -hmm. So that's really, really important to us. And that's a really important, um, kind of sales tool, if you like. Um, the second reason is just, generally that we find there is a huge appetite out there for probably from within the illustration community itself so other illustrators but there's a huge appetite for this kind of content and just seeing how other people work and an interest in in their processes and their um, inspiration and the third reason if i'm entirely honest is that they're really good fun to make um we, we work with kind of i guess up and coming and young filmmakers we give them a fairly blank canvas to a point i mean we say to them look we want to we want to by the end of this we want to show who the person is we want to show their work and their process beyond that you can kind of go off on one and um you know come up with some crazy ideas as to how to spin this narrative so we've had i don't know how many of them you've seen but um some of them are quite out there mm -hmm. <laughs> you know we've had brass bands playing and uh there's one that's all about a stalker um you know that we were about to release one that's um focused around uh taking a road trip so they're just great fun to make and um some of them has been picked up by uh vimeo some of them have been kind of vimeo staff picks um which has been amazing because you know you you kind of go to bed one night and wake up in the morning and your film's been watched twenty thousand times overnight mm -hmm. you know not that we're banking on that happening every time but it's happened four or five times now and, and actually 
it's a, a really good way to, to do our marketing. How many artists do you represent? So we're 36 at the moment, which is, a, is an ongoing conversation, really. It's, um, the problem is I, I, I fall in love with a new illustrator every day. I'm constantly having my, my head turned. <laughs> so, mm-hmm. you know, heart says yes. But what we're very mindful of is we don't want to lose, we, we, you know, we never want to become an agency that reps sort of, you know, 70, 80, 100 artists. Um, we want to have good personal relationships with everyone on our books. And, and you know, we really do have that at the moment. Um, there's four of us that work here managing um, projects. So really, we're only dealing with, you know, um, eight or nine of the guys each on a day to day basis. So um, we don't want to lose that personal touch. Um, also, we don't want to sign people who are too similar to other people on our books. I think it's, um, you know, a very competitive marketplace and it doesn't really help anyone if, um, if you sign artists that are all too similar to each other. There's enough competition out there anyway. Mm-hmm. So it, it's kind of getting harder to find new artists in a way because our criteria is um, they've got to be good enough they've got to bring something really, really new to, to the agency that, that we don't currently have. Obviously they have to be kind of commercially viable and, and they've got to be nice people. <laughs> That's always the, the, the fourth rule of, of Frank, you know, I think, um, I can't emphasize that enough really. It makes a huge difference. Um, and especially long term, if you're, if you're working with people long term, you know, you have to have to be people you get on with and, um, can work with. Do you, uh, does your team, continually look for illustrators like just sort of you know as part of the process no we do we do i mean like i say i'm i'm a real um i'm always looking i'm uh and i look all over the place i'm always looking on instagram spending far too long but yeah i mean i'll, I'll I, i'm on blogs you know I, I look at it's nice that every day i look at some of the u.s blogs constantly looking and, and what we do is we have a we have a shared spreadsheet where we um Anyone that we, you know, anyone that we like, we'll, we'll put them in the spreadsheet, you know, on the maybe list, I guess. Uh, and I'm a great believer in um, you have to kind of sit with someone's work for a while and, and look at it and then revisit it a couple of weeks or months later and, you know, check in on their progress and see what they've been doing since. Um, so we do that. And when we have our get togethers, we kind of go through the short list um, and we talk about, you know, who might be a good fit and, um, you know, who's a possibility between the four of us we have a really i think we have a really good uh barometer um of you know what what we're looking for and we certainly fine-tune that over the years and it, one of the things i've really learned is that there's a huge difference between um an illustrator who's what you love uh, and an illustrator who's going to work um commercially mm-hmm. for you um so you know sadly sometimes it, it hasn't worked out in the, in the past and there are people whose work i still absolutely adore and i still have frame prints on the wall but um we just didn't find them projects and that was probably partly down to us and who our clients were um but it didn't it it didn't kind of gel what have been some frustrations that you've experienced over the years in terms of like being in terms of being an agent and and navigating the relationships being the mediator navigating the relationships between you know between from illustrator to you and from you to the client the main challenge is really have been a, a slow erosion of illustrators' rights, um, and I think it is, so, you know, sadly something that we've certainly seen over the past decade. And if you talk to illustrators who've been in the business a lot longer than us, um, you know, things have changed and, and will continue to change. I mean, the, the the book publishing world is a is a perfect example. You know, there was a day where you would um, be commissioned and paid a license fee for the UK hardback edition of a book. And then when it went to a paperback, you would you would be paid again. And, and when it went to the German market and the French market and the US market, you would receive a fee each time. Book covers these days, you know, most publishers will ask for a, a global um, license across all media, even those yet to be <laughs> invented. So, yeah, there's obviously been changes there. I think social media is a very interesting area, which has many positives. A lot of brands want to use social and they know it's important, but they don't really value it the way that they value uh, traditional media. 
so they'll say things like, well, you know, we want to commission an artist, but it's, you know, it's only for social. You know, what, what does that really mean when your brand has uh, one or two million followers? That's a huge audience, potentially a much bigger audience than, than having having that image on a billboard. Mm-hmm. Or a book so, yeah, we're, we're, yeah, exactly. So we're, you know, we're constantly, um, constantly having to evolve, I guess, and reassess things. You know, I, I wrote an article earlier this year about kind of algorithm anxiety and, and how it's affecting the industry and, and some sometimes for the worst. What I don't like is when we see a brief that doesn't even ask about style or come straight in with the main criteria for the artist to be that they have a big social following. You know, I find that I find that really quite quite concerning. Um and also, you know, the idea that there are illustrators out there who think they're failing because they don't have X amount of followers or they don't have as many likes or they're judging their work on the likes that they're getting on a platform. Which, um, which I guess we all do to an extent, but um, I think it would be very sad if, if artists started to change their work and change what makes them unique to try and please an algorithm and try and please an audience on a particular platform. So yeah, I think that's some of the big challenges at the moment. I mean, overall, I, I you know have to say I'm very positive about the industry. I think we have, um, you know, as a collective, I think we have an incredible product that. You know, the, if there's one thing I've learned, it's that you mentioned some of the brands that we've worked with. I'm constantly amazed at the appetite from big brands to 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 use illustration and to engage with it and to put it front and central as part of their their brand identity. And I think that's really heartening. And I always, you know, I go and talk to grads and people say, you know, can I really earn a living doing this? And you know, obviously, some artists um, struggle more than others, but there is there is definitely work out there. Um, and it is very possible to earn a very good living being an illustrator. I'm not saying everybody will, but but there is lots of work out there. Mm-hmm. How many submissions do you get, let's say, a week? 150, 200, um, approximately. So it's a lot. And we, we uh, I mean, in the early days, we used to look at and reply to personally every single one. And unfortunately, that soon became such a drain on, on resource for a for a company of, well, at the time of two, two people now four. So what I say to everybody and what it says on our website is um, if you send us a submission, we absolutely will look at your work. We will see it. Um, if there's something there that we that we like and we think there's you know potential to work together, we will um, be in touch. We have signed people through that uh, process. So, you know, some of the artists, artists on our books now are people that just pinged us an email to submissions at handsomefrank.com. But yeah, you know, we, there, there is, there are a lot of people out there who want to work in this industry. I think that the most important thing, and I can't stress this enough, and I know it's very, very difficult, but it's to try and just find, find your own thing, you know, find your style, find what makes you unique and, uh, and, you know, try and hit upon something that, that works commercially, but that you can kind of own, you know, don't, don't get too hung up on trends. Don't try and follow the trends too much because trends will move on. But if you find a style that, that works for you, you can kind of adapt and evolve that over time. Mm-hmm. There's this age old argument. I think some illustrators quite rightly feel that they're, they have potential commercially if they can, if they can work across lots of different styles. And I can see that. I can see how that works for an individual, but for, for an agency, for somebody like ourselves with the people on our books, what we have to present is fact that they are the, the best person in in that um in that style out there um so rather than being somebody that can turn their hands to lots of different things this is what they do and they do it very well um and if you don't want them then perhaps you want someone in a different style so if my math is right um and it almost never is <laughs> uh 35 to 50 emails a day roughly submission submissions from illustrators yeah i'm thinking ebbs and flows but yeah you know and we, uh, you, Again, I'm hugely flattered by by the interest in in our company and the, um, people finding us and, and being interested in what we do. And you know, sometimes it's not even that people are saying, you know, can you represent me? Sometimes it's just people saying, any advice? You know, can you um, can you help me? Have you got any kind of um, pointers? Um, and you know, we try and, and and reply to people as as often as we can. We try and get out and talk at universities and events. Um, we try. I mean, one thing I've noticed especially through um instagram is is whether it's instagram stories or 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 however we you know trying to have a conversation we've done q and a's which are 
um, saved as our highlights on our Instagram profile, where we just kind of say, you know, we'll take take questions today, ask us anything. And people seem to really like that and engage with it. So it's something we're looking to do more of. I don't want to uh, beat a dead horse here, but there's a, I'm, I'm going to, yeah. I'm leading to a question. So you receive a lot of submissions okay. and yes. I suspect you, you're finding patterns with, mm. with, um, some of the mistakes that they're making with their art. Uh, some of the, th- some of the choices maybe that they're making that, um, maybe they shouldn't be making yeah. those choices. Like, do you, do you find those patterns? Do you see like, gosh, I wish that illustrators would stop doing X or man, how many times do we need to see why? I mean, do you, are you seeing those? Yeah, I mean, you, you do see patterns. I mean, I think, I mean, subject matter is, is, is huge. Obviously, subject matter is very important. And sometimes you get submissions where the work is technically very good, but you look at what they've drawn and you just can't really see a commercial any commercial potential for it we i guess we see lots of people who um don't specialize in terms of style which is something i've already mentioned and i think that is important for us and i can see it might make sense for people to feel that they, they should hedge their bets and show that they can do vector art and they can do hand rendered stuff and they can, they've done some lino cut and they've done you know some charcoal stuff um but for me you know i think what you need to do is present um a kind of unified, coherent portfolio of work that that, that shows exactly what, what somebody's going to get if they commission you. And I think it can confuse an art director or, or put somebody off if they see too much variance in terms of styles. Yeah, I mean, things like just how to present your work on, online. Um, you know, I think it's so important to, to have um, have a website that is... Um, it's kind of your own, you know, there are a lot of, as we know, there are lots of um, platforms out there where you can present your work, places like Behance and, and everywhere else, but just to have a home for your, for your work uh, and to present it kind of very clearly with no, um, no kind of, you know, there's no need for bells and whistles and um, fancy loading screens and um, anything like that. You just need to, to, to let uh, an art director or a potential um, client see the work as, as, quickly and clearly as possible the other thing i think is is hugely overlooked is timing um i i, I really believe and, and you know I've, I've sat with and talked to some of the guys we represent now some of the kind of biggest names out there and they have showed me their work three or four years before they um they approached us and, and it wasn't good enough and we wouldn't have represented them and they, and they and they know that and they're very you know aware of that um so I think a lot of people make the mistake. They kind of think, I need an agent to find me work. Therefore, I'm in a huge hurry to find an agent and I'm going to send my work everywhere and, um, you know, get representation. I think actually what, what, a, what an agency is looking for is, um, is somebody that has almost proved that they can stand on their own two feet, proved that they can find commercial work. You know, they have, they have some commercial projects in their portfolio. You know, they've, they've kind of, Waited to the point where their work is is ready and of the quality to take to an agent, because with with the best will in the world, an agency is not, you know, an agency like ourselves in our current position, we're not we're not looking for rough diamonds, we're not looking for raw potential, you know, we want to sign people that can hit the ground running and that our clients are going to want to commission straight away. Mm-hmm. So I think timing is, is is a big thing, and just being very honest with yourself about whether your work is is ready or whether you need a bit more time to to kind of pull things together and, and find your style and, and you know, create a, a, a body of work that's that's really coherent and um, of a high enough standard to take to an agency. So I know um, going all the way back to the beginning here, we have children and we have responsibilities <laughs> um, as much as we would love to, you know, sit and chat about <laughs> illustration all day long. I still have to look around and see if there are any more Cheerios on the ground here for me to eat for lunch. Um, by the way, I've, I've, I started off the conversation with a full mug of tea um, just to get myself in the zone. Uh, and uh, I'm almost finished it, but as an affront, as, a, as an absolute insult to the British sensibilities of tea making, it is just uh, hot water with a bit of uh, peppermint oh. extract and honey. That's all it is. Have I insulted okay. you fully? Well, Oh, I can send you some tea bags. Um, <laughs> do you have PG tips? Do you want me to send you some PG tips? Uh, it's all right. It's okay. 
you, you're a global agency. You've, you've seen, you've worked with clients from around the world. There are obviously differences and different needs from different markets, uh, American market versus British versus uh, Asian versus, you know, so different clients need different things. And uh, of course, um, trends come and go, movements come and go. But w- from in your experience, having having now been, um, having now run Handsome Frank for as long as you have, what are some sort of universal truths that you've found within within the contemporary illustration? Like what are some, it doesn't matter what market we're talking about. It doesn't matter what style we're talking about. Illustrators, like all illustrators need to do are fo- focus on what these, these like, base fundamental tenets of illustration and what are they what have you found them to be i think what people want from illustration is is kind of a tonic to everyday life you know i think i think there's an acceptance you know i think if if, if photography portrays something which is is unattain, unobt, unobtainable and and uh, and not real then it can feel a little bit false i think by its very nature everybody knows that the illustration isn't real so it, it it has a license and it gets away with a lot more. Um, and most of the work, most of the commissions we work on are about presenting life at its, at its best, at its fullest, at its funnest, at its most exciting, at its most glamorous. And I think it's really, really important for illustrators who want to work commercially to think about that and draw things that are, are you know, clients are going to want to commission if you like, because, and this brings me to another point, one of the things that really constantly, um, I guess, disappoints me is that, you know, we, we all work in the creative sector, you know, this, this world of advertising, design, publishing, loosely the creative world. Actually, there's a huge lack of creativity when it comes to um, having a leap of faith. Um, it's very, very rare for somebody to say to us, okay, well, I, I, I've never seen this artist draw this thing before, but, I think they could do it really well and you know we want we want to give it a try 90 percent of the time they're coming to us and saying we want to work with this person because they've drawn this this and this already and we want something similar or we want an evolution of that so what that means is almost it, it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy if you like you, you you kind of have to show that you can do the job before somebody will pay you to do the job mm-hmm. um and that's huge so you know, be very, very mindful of of, um, of what you're drawing and, and of, of, of the images and the subject matter that you're creating. And to that end, I think something that's hugely important and something that even the most successful and, and, and the busiest and the best illustrators find time for is self-initiated work. Because it's, it's only when you take the time out to show another side to your portfolio that you're given the opportunity to draw something different and then... You put that in the shop window, if you like. You put that in your portfolio and your printed or online portfolio. And then people will start to ask for that because they can see it. It's really important to keep challenging yourself and to keep showing different sides to your work and to keep pushing things and and showing that variance in subject matter if you're going to have a long career. To learn more about Handsome Frank, visit handsomefrank.com. If you enjoyed our conversation, please share it online subscribe to the podcast, and leave us a positive rating and review. This helps us find new listeners, and on a personal note, it would be nice to know that the podcast is helping. Continue the conversation in the comment section of each episode at illustrationdepartment.com forward slash podcast. This podcast is produced by the Illustration Department, a global leader in online education for illustrators. Visit us at illustrationdept.com for class offerings, testimonials, the Alumni Showcase, and more. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.